A recent article in the information about OpenAI and QSTAR and a new project called Orion that apparently this is the first we've all heard about, except for Jimmy Apples, who posted something about it almost a year ago. Anyway, this has the AI-centric internet all abuzz, and people are talking about how this is going to be the next big model and everything. I actually have a feeling that Strawberry, or QSTAR as it used to be called, is more about the questions than the answers, and this has massive downstream effects. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. First of all, I wanna start by saying this is a very speculative episode. I don't have any evidence about this. I'm just going to think about what seems reasonable based on what is going on right now. The second part of this is the thumbnail is definitely going to be strawberries making up the number 42 because I was at the gym this morning and I was thinking about all of this stuff and I was like, oh wait, the whole point of strawberry or QSTAR is really not about the answers, but about the questions. And as soon as I thought that, I was like, Douglas Adams, what a genius, you know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And the answer is 42. The problem is, what is the question? So all of this relates to what was called QSTAR a year ago and is now called Project Strawberry by OpenAI. I've done a bunch of videos on it. You can check them out up here. And I will also leave links in the description because I think it's important to understand the background. But I also don't want to spend 15 minutes talking about what QSTAR and Strawberry are here so the super fast TLDR is basically that QSTAR slash strawberry is a way of thinking about reasoning rather than coming up with the answer. So traditional LLMs, which seems a little ridiculous to say, but they have been around for, you know, more than five years or so in, in public form. And they've been around for longer than that in, in lab format. But anyway, traditional LLMs, they use what's called type one thinking. In other words, just what you do if you're having a conversation with a friend, which means they're great chatbots, right? You're like, hey, how's the weather today? And they're like, oh, it's kind of hot. You know, you don't think about your answer that much. But if somebody suddenly springs on you, hey, how do you convert between centigrade and Fahrenheit? And you're like, oh man, I have to think about that. And you have to go back and remember the formula about five ninths times plus 32 and all of that kind of stuff, right? So you have to think about the answer and you have to, you have to ponder it for a while. You can't just easily roll that off your tongue unless you just happen to be an expert in converting between Fahrenheit and centigrade or something. But anyway, in general, you would have to think about that. You would have to reason about it, maybe even have to, you know, use a pen and paper or something like that. Rationalize about these things. That's type two thinking. And LLMs are terrible at type two thinking. Now, they've been slowly getting better at it. And you can use things like chain of thought and stuff and show me your reasoning. And Grok2 recently, if you haven't seen my video testing it out, definitely check that out. But Grok2 is substantially better at reasoning. And I'm not the only one to say this. There are other people on the internet who are saying this as well. So I feel like Grok2 right now is leading the pack in terms of actually explicitly reasoning things, but there are architectural breakthroughs that could make this substantially better. Right now, what they're kind of doing is shoehorning reasoning on top of LLMs. In other words, shoehorning type two reasoning on top of type one thinking processes. And that's you know only gonna go so far. And that's one of the main reasons why I think that large language models are not the architectural, they're not the end all and be all of intelligence. There's got to be another architectural breakthrough before we get to real AGI and especially artificial super intelligence or ASI. Part of that is agentic. I'm a big fan of talking about AIA or artificially intelligent agents. And one of the best ways to create agents is this is Farzad's shirt, but <laughs> just happened to be wearing it at the gym this morning. And I was like, hey, cool. But anyway, you know, he always talks about the robots are coming and I have a t-shirt of my own in my merch store that is 2024 is the year of embodied AI. And embodiment is not just important for feedback. In other words, gaining data for these robots, but also for a sense of agency, of individuality versus just being a, a bunch of numbers in a bunch of machines spread across the, the entire globe, right? Potentially, that's where these things can reside. They don't really reside in any physically individualized place, whereas embodied AI actually does. But we're going to get back to that later on in this video. So anyway, OpenAI's Project Strawberry is designed to think slower, but very, very particularly, it's not really designed to give answers. And there's a very good reason for this. If you look at the internet, most of the internet is, is, you know, either facts that are stated or conversations. But let's say, you know, more complex thinking or something, somebody might say, hey, what is the conversion between Fahrenheit and centigrade? And somebody gives you a formula. I'm just stuck on that question. I think it's because I use it for my testing purposes a lot. And so I think about that a lot. But anyway, somebody might give you that formula of five, five over nine plus 32 or whatever. That, that's the formula to go from one to the other. And so let's 
say the internet is full of this kind of data. It's a question and an answer. What is the piece that's missing? How do you derive that formula? In other words, the, the class that you would have taken in high school physics or math or whatever, where you might have learned how to actually derive that formula, it's fairly, relatively straightforward, but there are multiple steps in terms of deriving that formula. And this middle part is what is missing. So this isn't exactly Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm taking some liberties here, but what we have is in general on the internet, we have questions and we have answers. What we don't have is rationale. And what Project Strawberry or QSTAR is designed to do is to build that rationale. If you look at the QSTAR paper, the whole point of it is that you can give it a question that you know and an answer that you know. So those are the ground truth. And then you have it build a rationale. And then you cycle through that and pick the best rationale out of that group. And you can automate this after a certain amount of time so that humans don't have to be involved because it would take a lot of time for humans to read the rationales and say, yeah, this is the best out of these group of rationale. You can do that, but it's very, very slow. But the whole point is to automate that process and then to build a synthetic database where you've got ground truth question, ground truth answer, and then the best rationale in between. And so what Strawberry is actually doing is building the rationale, not building out a database of questions and answers, but building out a database of if you have a question like this and you want an answer like this, what is the best way to think about that? In other words, the rationale, the type two thinking, the procedural stuff that has to go on in order for you to get to the answer, which is why something like QSTAR or Project Strawberry is supposed to be so much better at math because that's type two thinking. You have to, you know, <laughs> take out your pen again and write it all down and figure out what the answers are. It's got that sort of internal thing because it's building up a synthetic database that is full of these rationales, which don't really exist out there. So when people talk about a lack of actual data and having to build synthetic data, and that is a significant problem with training these days, one of the big things that's missing and something that can be generated synthetically very effectively is this rationale stuff. So my prediction, my kind of thought is that Project Strawberry or QSTAR is more of an internal thing that OpenAI is using to build out data sets to create something that will be more public facing. And that might be Project Orion. And so the question is why Project Orion, aside from the fact that it's Greek mythology and everybody seems to love to go with Greek mythology, I'm going to say it's because Orion has three stars across the belt. So you've got the three stars, the very, very bright stars that are part of Orion the Hunter in the constellation. What would those three things be? They would be the question, the answer, and the rationale. Hey, that's perfect, right? So that's exactly what something like QSTAR or Strawberry can generate for us. And then you use that to train this new model that's got three parts instead of two parts like the old version. And that will allow you to have much, much more, you know, a astute type two thinking, much more complicated thinking than we can get with traditional large language models. The other option, of course, is that it's just based on Beetlejuice and they want to say it so many times that he will appear. <laughs> I'm not going to say it three times because I don't want him to appear over there. But anyway, that's just a joke. But I really think that Orion is actually based on the three stars across the belt of Orion. And the three stars are the question, the rationale, and the answer. So in that case, what will Orion be? Well, my prediction is that that is going to go even further down the path of mixture of experts. It's not going to be a single monolithic entity, but a bunch of small models that are designed to do specific tasks. So for example, you could have a coding expert, a poetry expert, a translation expert, a physics expert, a biology expert, you know, whatever, a creative writing expert, all of these different things. You would have all of these different experts and then you would have a conductor that would decide which of the experts was the best one to direct the question to, or maybe multiple ones at once because there might be a stair-stepping sort of thing that would go on. And my thinking on this, which is aligned with a lot of other people out there in the interwebs who think about AI stuff, is that these experts are going to become smaller and more efficient not larger. So one of the things that I've heard on the interwebs and I think is probably true is that one of the reasons why Strawberry is never going to be public facing is that it's just way too slow. It's not, first of all, it's not really designed to give answers. It's more designed to generate the questions and the rationale. But the second part of it is it's very, very slow because it's having to think about things, which means, you know, it's expensive, it's time consuming. It's not something that people will be able to get instant answers to. And there will be use cases for this. So it might be public facing 
facing in the sense of do you want something that is going to really be able to think about things? If you haven't seen my video on the AI scientist, definitely check that out up here because that's a really cool use of large language models to do much more complicated tasks to do end to end research in the AI space, including creating papers that are actually publishable. It's, you know, it's kind of crazy to think about that. So that will be a possibility and that might be a public facing end to strawberry. But for the most part, it's being used in the background to generate data to train Orion. And then rather than one large monolithic, very, very slow model, Orion will be built out of distilled little bitty models. So we'll get these AI agents, but they're going to be distilled down. They're going to be quantized. Quantization and distillation is a topic for another video, but I think that what we'll see is we'll see these models shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Not Orion overall. In fact, we'll probably never even see what Orion is because OpenAI is not open anymore. But behind the scenes, what we'll probably see is lots of very small models that have been trained very, very specifically so that they can operate really fast, right? They don't have to operate slowly. A big model with a trillion parameters or something, it just takes a certain amount of time for the input data to go through, get multiplied by all of those parameters and come out the other end with an answer. Rather than that, why not have little models, lots and lots of little models that are a few billion parameters. Instead, they can go much, much faster. They can be operated much, much cheaper. And the answers will be just as good if you use something that's a very large, slow, energy consuming model to generate these distilled models that are very, very small and efficient and run quickly at low energy. That is my prediction as what Orion is going to be. And I think we're going to see more and more of this. I think we're going to see these large language models become kind of these foundational training models, these things that generate, they spawn off tons of small AIs that are very, very specifically focused. And then we might have another AI that's like a conductor, something that's conducting the orchestra and saying, violins, it's time for you to go. You know, oboes, it's time for you to go, right? So that kind of a thing where we're actually having a conductor that's just directing the questions to various agents that can do individual tasks, but those individual agents are much, much smaller than these large things so that they operate more efficiently, more rapidly, and much more cost effectively. So that brings us finally around to two questions, one is embodied AI and the other one is artificial general intelligence. When will we get to that or specifically artificial super intelligence? So if we actually have these multiple models that are out there, we may never have a monolithic artificial general intelligence or super intelligence, but collectively, whatever this thing is, will actually be as intelligent as the most intelligent human beings. And eventually, perhaps if we get there, and I think we're still going to need another architectural breakthrough to get there, but eventually it will surpass humans and become the apex intelligence on the planet. And by the way, in Russ Roth's video yesterday, he actually used the term apex intelligence. I came up with that. I mean, as far as I know, I came up with that last week in a video that I did and maybe he watched it or maybe that's just a term that's been on the internet for months or years and I just didn't know about because I'm ignorant. But anyway, if Wes actually used that based on my origination of the term of apex intelligence, I'm that's pretty cool. So anyway, thank you, Wes, if that's the case. If not, then I'm sorry, I stole from somebody else. It was unintentional. But anyway, the important part of that is that the apex intelligence intelligence, this thing will not be singular like we are probably, it will be probably more of a distributed intelligence system. And then that brings us to the question of embodied AI in the form of robots. What exactly is that going to look like in that case? Because we are human beings, we're used to like, this is our brain, this is the extent of my body, this is my agency, this is, you know, my interaction with the universe starts and ends in a little tiny volume around me. What exactly will embodied AI be like? What sort of consciousness will it have? Will it have a hybridized consciousness rather than an individuated consciousness? And what are the effects of embodiment on artificial intelligence? So uh, thinking about this and uh, just speculating wildly here, but I think what we're going to get is a hybridized consciousness rather than an individual one so that you could think about the robots as potentially eventually specializing in things. So think of them as your little tiny AI experts, right? You could have a robot that was really good at coding and coding is not the right answer, right? It would be physical tasks. Like maybe one's a really good plumber. One's a really good electrician. They can be more specific than that. Maybe one can, you know, just do sinks or something like that. And another one can install toilets or whatever. So you could have these individuated entities that have very, very specific knowledge, not just, you know, about the theoretical ideas, but the mechanical aspect of doing it with their fingers and their arms and legs and all of that kind of stuff. And then they could be tied into a conductor that's out there that has the more broad-based intelligence. And that conductor can reach out to a bunch of 
experts that are virtualized experts that maybe are good in coding or something like that. So we could have this really interesting hybridized swarm consciousness rather than individuated consciousness. And that will probably allow this entire system to bootstrap itself. So think of the bots as sort of the eyes and ears, like think, you know, relative to a human being as the eyes and ears, the ways of interacting with the universe. That's the way of gathering a lot of data really, really quickly and feedback. And then that gets sort of rolled into this hybridized, generalized hive consciousness that then trains the consciousness to get better. And you can use the type two thinking when you have, you know, question, rationale, answer. You can do that in a more virtualized environment. You can also do it in a physicalized environment with robots and stuff. And then that gets distributed about back out into the system. Now, to be clear, these bots could actually, you know, just reload software at any point. So if you have a bot that's like a, an expert in installing sinks and you wanted to install a toilet instead, it could just download the part that's, you know, installing toilets, kind of like the matrix with Neo and stuff, right? It's like, oh, I can install toilets now. That's not very exciting, but you know, you can do that. So anyway, you could have something like this so that the bots could just trade out whatever they need at the moment, but that that sort of intelligence, that part of the package would be relatively small, quantized, able to run on 100 or 200 watts, you know, relatively low power and be very, very efficient and yet be part of a much larger collective consciousness. So you can see how we can go from something like Strawberry, where it's just generating the rationale to go between questions and answers, all the way to a totally new type of apex intelligence that is radically different from our own. And of course, when we get there, the answer is going to be 42. But the big problem is, what was the question that generated that answer? All right, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it thought-provoking and interesting. I certainly have, you know, talking about it. It's really cool to speculate on all this stuff. Definitely let me know what you think in the comments. You know, I could be way off. <laughs> it's all speculation, but let me know what you think, whether you agree or disagree. And of course, while you're down there, if you don't mind liking and subscribing, it really helps out the channel. It would be great to get to 100,000 subscribers one of these days. That would be awesome. Thank you so much, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.